Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today my friend Emily Smith came in for a chat and she is an assistant producer in Factual Television and so we had a, a really good conversation around the reality of working in broadcasting. So we spoke about how we tap into media today um, and how Amazon and Netflix are changing the way we watch and consume TV programs and content and so forth. Uh, and what's in store for the future of technology as we come, become more and more connected. And we also have a little conversation around like the mental toughness of working in a freelance role in the gig economy as we're seeing the world going more and more towards people working on their own or freelance and not wanting to work in big companies. So it's quite a, a shift in, in mindset and mentality and Emily seems to uh, be coping really well and it's really interesting to hear her perspective. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime anywhere boom and we're live hello emily hi how are you doing i'm very well thank you how are you good good so we used to work together we did like so 2012 mm -hmm. which is cool and you've blossomed into the wonderful young lady that you are today hopefully Maybe. still still working on it <laughs> so what do you do now uh, so now, since graduating and working with you, and also not working for a little bit and doing different other various things, looking for a job, I now work in television, broadcast television, making factual TV as an assistant producer. Nice. Did you do that at university? No, I did classics. And classics. So how yes. did you get from classics to wanting to work in TV and stuff? Well, the thing about working in TV is you can actually do a media studies degree. I'm quite opinionated about whether that's a good <laughs> use of your money. And because uh, tuition fees went up for my year, I wanted to do something that I thought would be valuable uh, in the long run. It hasn't proved to be that valuable because no one cares that I've got a degree. No, literally no one cares what you <laughs> No one did. cares. I did chemistry. No, exactly. But I do, I do um, try and occasionally reference Virgil or Horace or Ovid just to make me feel uh, less bad about my £51,000 worth of debt that I've got. 51000 mm Mm-hmm. And, so, it, and it's, it's ongoing. It's like an 8% um, interest rate. Yeah, so. but they, they're quite cheeky because they only charge you at the end of the year. So even though you're paying back, they'll charge you for that year's interest. Yeah, so they let it all kind of they load up. They let it crew up, up mm. and then they like whack you with a bigger bill. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm not that keen on that. But yeah, so I work in TV now. Nice. How have you found it? I love my job. I really, really love it. It's very, very hard. It's difficult. It's very constraining and the commitment is just all consuming. And I find that a lot of my friends and partners that I've had don't really understand what it is that I do. And they don't really understand that it's not quite the same as most of their jobs. In what way? Um, mainly that it's even though it's very flexible in one way it's also very not because the hours are just so so rigorous you end up doing crazy crazy long hours that are definitely illegal all <laughs> the time and that's just an industry standard so it's very exploitative generally wow. but no one really talks about it because it's the same for basically everyone so so what do you do so you have like a project a tv show whatever yeah and you're working all hours, whatever you have to do to get it done. Exactly. And I think as the industry has changed, even in the time that I've been working in TV and I've watched that kind of happen, it means there's less and less money. Whereas I think maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, someone doing my job would actually get a lot more money and have a lot more benefits, but they've kind of, they're, they're scraping that back and they're, they're just making one person do the job of three people. Um. And there are so many less benefits now. You don't have kind of unlimited booze, unlimited drink, like everything you is just on a budget. You can't get wasted at work anymore. Nightmare. No, there's no drinking and driving now, which Nightmare. is a shame. Nightmare, yeah. But there used to be loads of like independent small production companies, right? And yeah. I guess with Netflix and Amazon, it must have shrunk a lot now? Or? Yeah, a lot of the more um, independent companies are still kind of bought out by people like Sky because they can't really afford to be making as much TV on their own. There are still a few um, really great independent companies that are making 
groundbreaking, compelling TV. But the majority of them are just bigger companies that are independent and they consider themselves indie. However, they do still have 10% share taken up by a bigger conglomerate. Or oh, they say they're owned by bigger. Yeah. And is most of the content being generated for Netflix and... So for what I do, no. I'm still kind of working in broadcast television, although okay, yeah. I think things are going to start and ch- start to change. And I think a lot of the shows that I'm working on will try and find another home, whether it is abroad or online, because, yeah, TV is just... I think it's not struggling, but it needs to innovate. Yeah, and yeah. I think it's not innovating at the rate that it can be with the onset of other kind of competing platforms like Netflix and Amazon and startups that are um, made by entrepreneurs who have that young mindset, whereas a lot of TV is still run by old white board members who don't understand their target audience and they don't really understand their employees either. So, With all the analytics stuff, it's like it's so easy to understand who you're audience are and and stuff but you can mostly you can i guess do youtube and like it's really changing a lot yeah i, think I don't think i even watch i probably don't even watch tv i know that, um, that's scary that is really really scary and i think the the audience that do watch kind of your flicking channels um is getting older and the young people are flocking to youtube and they're watching stuff um on netflix and they're watching things on amazon because it's um, very easy to to get what you want there, whereas the old form of television is kind of it's out of it's out of touch, and that it's Massively. not giving the young people what they want, so they're yeah, not yeah. they're not going to watch it. Yeah, no, true, true. I had a big debate with my mates. Most of us, to be honest, I may say I watch sport. Mm. So like Sky Sports, BT Sports, they've got all the football and everything, and then programs. Uh, I watch Netflix, or I like guess go down a rabbit hole in YouTube, mm, or even yeah. Facebook. There's quite yeah. a lot of stuff. Yeah, people don't have the attention span that they used to. So even though they'll dedicate an hour a week to watching Game of Thrones, they're not necessarily going to watch the kind of obstocks that I make um, unless something really catches them. But the people do like documentaries, though. Yeah, people do. And that's what's really interesting is because I've always loved documentaries. Yeah, they're great. And I've always loved crime. And now it's really in vogue, which I find kind of exciting but also a bit shocking for me because it used to be a bit of my niche and now it's it's very widespread but that means that there's so much more to watch so you're doing are you working on some crime stuff at the moment yes i uh i am working on just mainly crimes obstocks which is observational documentaries so they're just documentaries where you as a viewer just see basically what someone else does and there's not very much producing although there is always producing in television um but there's not any kind of presenter directing um, the flow of what you see. So it's just like a fly on the wall documentary? Yeah. Where's your next one? My next one's in Kansas. Wow. So I'm going to be following the cops. Nice. I was going to do American accent, but it's really bad. No, so I'm not going to do it. But I th- yeah, I think that's going to be very interesting and very topical. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. A, yeah. So you're going to sit, so you're going to be, or you're going to be in a car with a couple of cops? Yes. And I am in the back seat. In the back seat. Camera out and yes. So um, I just did that with the cops, well, the police in Northampton. Oh right. Um, and that was very eye-opening. Yeah, yeah. But I think that it's going to be. Well, like, racial tensions are much like stronger in America, I guess, than here. Exactly. It's Although some... you'd be surprised, there was a lot of kind of racial tension in Northampton. Really? I think Brexit has made. What between what police and? Oh, not oh, well. A lot of. Brits hate the police anyway. Just socially, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of kind of just bad blood anyway. Yeah. yeah. I think that's it, definitely worse in America, but that's because you're more likely to get shot by a by an officer than you are here. But yeah, still, I think just generally in groups in Northampton, there was a lot of tension and a lot of people that didn't like each other. Crazy. Mm. Hence Brexit. Hence Brexit. And then in Kansas... Kansas is super interesting. Yeah, I think also because of its geography in America, yeah. it's um, it's kind of on a state line. So I'm going to be in Kansas City, and you've got Missouri on one side, and then you've got Kansas on the other. Uh, right. So I think, from what I believe, um, American states don't really converse or work very well together because Slightly of their jurisdictions. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think that's going to be interesting. Yeah. How long are you going to be there for? 
I don't know yet. That's the thing about TV again. You just don't really know. You might have a rough idea, but then someone will tell you to do something for longer or they'll just be like, oh, you're not staying any longer, which does happen as well. So I think I'll be there for six weeks to two months and then back and forth for the next kind of couple of months. But who knows? And with these, obviously, to give a good, like, unbiased view, is it must be quite difficult. Certainly if you're going to be in a cop car with... Mm some cops in America and mm. they turn out to be racist or yeah. you know, they're doing stuff that's like not quite doesn't sit well with you yeah that's that's something that I'm going to have to reconcile but also I don't really know how it's going to go because what we tried to do in um, in the last show that I did is make sure that we have as little impact on what goes on in front of us and people always think oh if there's a camera then, then people are going to act differently and that is true however you do forget so I could I can film someone and they'll be so pissed off they'll be so pissed off and then ten seconds later they'll just forget about it. Yeah. yeah so yeah. so if you're out with officers for twelve hours for six weeks, it does just become part of the daily routine. So what although about I, the people that they're interacting with, do they have to be on camera or? Uh, I don't know how it's going to work in America because in the series I've just done. Um, we would use public interest and also oh, okay. just go in with the police. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then we kind of seek consent and just find out all the legalities afterwards. Um, however, in America, if you go into someone's house without permission, they do shoot you. So I don't <laughs> really know how that's going to happen. Just stand well back, get the vest on. I know. In fact, stay in the car. I know. But it's strange. Also, Americans love being on TV and they've had oh, cops true, yeah on the TV for such a long time that I think that yeah. actually getting consent and getting people that want to be on TV is probably going to be easier in America. Yeah, yeah, that'd be I fun. Don't know. It'd be fun. A bit scary. How have you like mentally uh, adjusted to this freelance, like freelance, mm. gig economy? Because mm. usually, I was just saying, we were talking about this before, uh, most of you, when you're growing up, it's like education. If mm. you go to university, you go to uni, and then you typically follow like a conventional career. And our parents, well, upset my dad anyway he was in his job for like 37 years i mean a lot of the older generation are what you know they go like a stable whereas you've just gone like you never know when your next gig's going to be um how have you found that like transitioning and it is difficult at times and it has its benefits but then i think psychologically it can be very stressful and i think you have to be able to have that mindset that you will work again because for all you know you might not yeah yeah tv is very very reference based so it's very insular so if you do a good job you generally just get referred on someone else and it's very kind of constant like that yeah and um, but there are always those days when you're in between jobs where you just think oh god my rent's due i might not work again it does it does get scary yeah um but i've been very lucky and i haven't had periods of unemployment yet touch wood nice nice so to get in there must have been quite tough originally yes it's very difficult to get in did you do like runners jobs and well for me i found it quite surprising so i uh, i was lucky enough to work with you obviously so i had a, a working background <laughs> um but at the same time i also and you worked with me throughout uni yeah i worked for yeah. you with um throughout uni but i yeah. was also working at a production company I don't yeah. know if you remember yeah, yeah, yeah. but doing adverts yeah and i was lucky to have that background and so i thought oh okay got a first class degree nice. from a rust group uni <laughs> just cool. throw that in better than me <laughs> yeah. and um i've been working since i was 13 i've got loads of things on my cv good grades generally hopefully quite personable i don't know you can mm. tell me. Mm. all right maybe yeah maybe. um so i thought oh okay i can easily get a job in tv but it was not easy and for five months after i graduated i just couldn't get a job in tv and i was applying for running jobs which is supposedly the bottom just- rung of the tv industry but I wasn't hearing back, really. Harsh. Yes, really harsh. And that's the most difficult thing, I think, is when you come out of uni, you're kind of bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and really excited for life and you're ready. And then it's a huge knockback to realise that actually you're one of a million and not one in a million. (laughs) Well, that's the thing. And also, like, loads of others have first-class degrees from lots of great universities. Like, you, you kind of... Suddenly the real world is so much bigger than your school your university and also so many options exactly and i think you have to make a decision on what you want to do 
and you're in such a transition period that you're not even really that sure you're like oh I really want to do this but do I do I really want to do something that doesn't really seem to be lending itself to me because no one's calling me up yeah, even yeah, though I'm yeah, sending yeah. my CV out yeah, yeah it's hard it's hard yeah. even deciding what to do whether to go into TV or to try something yeah. else or because you've got no idea and, and they, they all say like you can do anything you want to do which is, which is hard because if you've got so many options you've got no idea what to choose you haven't tried anything or you maybe you've tried a little bit of stuff it's hard to get into you get kind of pushed and pulled by different influences in your life as well yeah, because that's true, yeah. my parents were very much of the mindset oh you've got a good degree just go into the city and earn loads of money and retire early. Yeah. Even though they're very creative people as well, they just kind of saw that as, not not the American dream, but like the, the dream for their daughter to do really well and yeah. be yeah. financially uh, able to buy a house and not have to worry. And um, I guess just what you do after you do a good degree is yeah. go on yeah. and go into the city and it's follow that. It's the one that, that. Ends, pays the most. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I had that, but also they were very much of the mindset that I had to make my mind up and they know that I'm very creative and I always have been. So they were also saying, well, why don't you go and be an author? You always wanted to be a writer. Why don't you go be a journalist? Go and do a master's at the city um, university and do journalism, which was also another option. Yeah. And I, I nearly did that. But I couldn't be bothered to do the application form. That's the truth. <laughs> I looked through and my self-defeatist attitude was, I just, I can't do this. So I just didn't do it. So that's, that's, why I didn't, that's why I didn't do journalism. But also it's another, but you, don't, you haven't got to do a journalism to master's or degree to be a journalist. Exactly. I mean, I just set up a podcast. I wouldn't say I'm a journalist. No. But it's still a little kind of media-y platform. I think anyone that finds out about other people is a journalist of sorts and that's what I'm yeah, doing yeah. in television is I'm telling stories and that's what I always wanted to do and that's yeah. my vocation in life I think is meeting people and hopefully having an opportunity to extend them by putting them on a platform where other people can hear their voices it's so. funny because you do something quite different to me but actually really we do the same thing so I'm uh, obviously run a headhunting firm and I'm speaking to people about their stories and helping them through their lives and careers and stuff and then with the podcast I'm speaking to people about their stories and sharing their stories and the thing that, mo that motivates me most is like the human contact completely like a proper conversation with someone because if we were having this conversation on whatsapp you know you'd be like thinking how to respond to me mm. and I'd be thinking the same and whereas here we're having a like real life conversation mm. And, and, and most people are like losing that now. No, I know. I actually also had that part in my head, which was thinking, do I just stay at Bentley Lewis? Because I, and I say this unbiased, I actually loved working here so much that that almost made me want to change what I think I would actually really want to do just because I loved the working environment and we had yeah. so much fun. We did, we did. And I feel like I did yeah. grow a lot working yeah, yeah. working here. So I thought that was also another option and I could have done that and I think I would have still been happy. Yeah. So that's the thing. When you're 21 and you're graduated, you have so many different paths and actually you can find something you love down many of the, those paths. It's yeah. just, it's no, just picking one and going for it. Yeah, but most most people I meet, and this is going to sound a bit sad, I find most people don't enjoy what they do. Mm. So may, I mean, ninety percent of the people I meet, and they've probably either pushed, they either got pushed by their families, let's say, into a career that they didn't really want to do, or you end up getting caught in something. You're making money, you're living in a city, you need to cover mm. rent and all this stuff, and again, people end up don't having don't have the courage to actually try and do something that they really enjoy or even they actually don't really know what they enjoy like it's quite it's a very tough thing for you to have found something that you really enjoy mm -hmm. is really lucky yeah I'm very fortunate that I stuck with it because I did very nearly um change my mind so I think I so I graduated in August and I was casually applying for jobs and what I didn't realize is how you have to apply for jobs is you have to apply for 100 jobs a week yeah, yeah, yeah but to me I've always been a little bit um I guess lazy in my attitude sometimes even though I'm really motivated and ambitious I've also been a bit of a slacker at times so I was just applying for like one job every couple of days and then just getting a bit defeated when I didn't hear back and then just applying for another one and so um I was working all that time and I did get offered a few other jobs from other industries I worked in market research for a bit um but by f end of January, 
I was just thinking, oh God, okay, maybe I just need to go to the city and maybe I just need to do something else. Yeah. And maybe my dreams of doing something to do with kind of writing or presenting or film or TV are just pipe dreams. So I started applying for stuff in the city and started getting traction Did all you? of a sudden. Lots of banks and... Yeah. And all of a sudden I was just like, okay, well, at least someone wants me and these are really, really great firms. Yeah. And then that's when finally my... Um, my one job came through and that was my first ever job and that's the company that I just finished with on Friday oh amazing so that 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 was yeah. just a complete lifeline and it was at a point where I was just about to change I guess my 20s yeah it's quite a big jump from taking a job a permanent job in a bank with all the benefits and everything to I'll just take this two month contract and see how it goes completely and hopefully get another one and Interesting. The mindsets, mindsets, the tough, the, the 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 most important thing. But I was so so excited going for that first job interview, and just knowing that I was going to give it everything. Yeah. Because all I wanted was an interview. Because I know me, I might not put the most effort in, and then that's a fault of my own. I might not put enough effort into the application form, which is bad enough as it is, because you should be doing that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. all I wanted to do is get in front of that person and sell myself because I knew that they would hopefully see my enthusiasm yeah, yeah. and just give me a, a shot, which is all I wanted. And that's all I needed. And then, yeah, the rest is history. Amazing. That's awesome. I love that. I yeah. love that. Is that been, was that the biggest, like the toughest bit? Do you find um, transitioning from uni to work? and? It's Yeah, it is difficult because as I said, you just expect things to be different and you think that you're different. And that's one thing I've learned in life is you learn that anything can happen to you. And it just does so you just think oh I'm different so this is going to be easy for me and you can be very complacent if you've yeah, yeah, yeah. if you've been lucky enough to kind of breeze through life and do well at school and if do well at uni well, yeah um, you can just suddenly get a real shock when not that everything was given to you on a plate because it wasn't you worked for it but when you realise yeah it's a big world out there and you've got to do you've got to put so much work in to get very little back yeah that's true also the, the thing you find when you start work is it's it's like real cliche but it's like a marathon you know like climbing the mountain and there's so many it's such a long career that you have and so many different routes and things to do you find I find when I when I meet um, people who have just finished uni is they're like really trying to rush to get to mm. like the top or you know specific thing and they're not enjoying like the journey and the learning and the experiences and, and stuff like that. It's really important to do, I think. I agree. I think there's so much pressure, but it's, you kind of put it on yourself because you want to look good. You want to meet up with your friends from school who've got jobs and say, oh, I've got my job that I wanted. You want to, you feel that competitive nature that I think is kind of fostered within you if you grow up in the UK where you're an individual and you're told you can do whatever you want and you, you really, really want to be doing that more for everyone else rather than yourself yeah yeah, yeah. it's right. hard to get out of that and then obviously with uh, instagram and facebook and all this stuff everyone's posting cool stuff of what they're doing and and you just get caught in a i don't know what it is just what your peers are doing you want to be impressive to them you want to show that you're doing well and succeeding and stuff like that when really you need to like focus on what you enjoy yourself if you can get that all sorted then the rest of it just takes care of itself yeah it makes it a lot easier for you to enjoy your job yeah, yeah if yeah. you stop yeah. caring so much about what everyone else is doing and what they they are thinking and just think about what you're doing and what you're thinking and have control over yourself yeah yeah that's yeah. no, tough one it's a tough one amazing great to chat thank you for coming on and good luck with kansas thank you i'm and looking forward to it when you get back come back on and let us know what your experience was i will do if i don't get shot cool good luck <laughs> hopefully not <laughs> good luck hey folks thanks for listening don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places <laughs>